Okay. Well, my name is Natalie Hutchins, and I am one of six Title I supervisors. We each have our own program office that we supervise in addition to our school improvement um, plans and our schools that we supervise. So um, today I'm going to be bringing to you just a few stories from my experience over the few years that I've been in Cobb. I think it's my 17th or 18th year here in Cobb. I try to remember how old my kid was when I actually started in Cobb. It kind of helps. <laughs> so 17 or 18, something like that. And um, just tell you a little bit about me and kind of how I got started in this work of family engagement. So when I started here um, 17 or 18 years ago, I was hired as the bilingual parent facilitator. I'm very fortunate. I speak Spanish as well as Portuguese. Portuguese, not as much now because I don't use it that often. Um, and um, Spanish is my second language. So that's um, not, a, not a big deal. And um, I was actually teaching sixth grade English and Spanish and Christian school. And one of the my church members was like, Natalie, you'd be great at this job. She worked at a school in Cobb. She's like, please interview. We need some help. Um, so I was like, sure, cool, no problem. Um, and this at this time was like 2004. So it was the first time that Cobb had introduced the parent facilitator role um, in our district and I interviewed with the principal. She was wonderful. And she's like, well, you have a great personality. So you'll be, you know, really great fit for our school. However, I don't know what a parent facilitator is. I don't know what it does. So, you know, just go for it. So, um, I was like, great, you can't tell a person like me who's super, super outgoing and energetic that here's a job description just do whatever you want, because I'm actually going to do exactly that. You know, I'm going to take it, run with it and just make it amazing. <laughs> so um, it was a really, really great and fun experience. Fast forward to 10 years and I found myself supervising the 50 or 60 parent facilitators of which the job responsibilities I used to share. Um, so it has just been a really, really wonderful um, experience. And I'm hoping uh, that today my goal is really just to share some really practical stories with you of the experiences I have and how um, they've really been kind of shaped and molded here in Cobb and what things look like in regards to family engagement and kind of pique your interest a little bit um, to some things that may be going on at your schools. Um, so just to let you guys know, this session is being recorded. I did record the session from earlier. I'm not sure exactly where they'll land, but I'm sure they'll land somewhere and we'll send you some CTLS posts to let you know. Um, this is a conversation, um, even though you know, you've done a lot today. I just hope that you keep your cameras on and that we engage because we're going to have lots of breaks to really just kind of talk about what's going on in schools. Um, I am one of those people that I my nightmare is to be the old lady in central office who doesn't even know what a kid looks or smells like. So for me, I really try to stay close to schools. The kids, I love them to death. If you wanna know what's good or bad or ugly about a school, ask a kid. They have no filter. They will, you know, they will tell you hands down. So I missed a part of this last year, but I um, actually always adopt a classroom. So if anybody has a classroom they want me to adopt, just let me know. But um, when I adopt a classroom, I'll either have like breakfast or lunch with the kiddos once a month. And I teach a lesson once a month because because that is what we are about at the district. We have to make sure that teaching and learning is happening at a very high level. And I don't wanna lose that piece um, of my why. So um, if you have a classroom, you're like, hey Nat, come be my person. I would love to push in and, um, and love on your kids. So we're gonna have some fun um, and really just kind of have a conversation. So nothing on this PowerPoint you'll have to take and have notes from and say, oh my gosh, what was on slide number three? I can't remember. Um, I wanted to highlight Castle for just a moment. And with CASEL's five core SEL competencies, we're really gonna focus on families and caregivers and how that we build relationships in the school. And when I think about adults learning with other adults, there are a couple of things that CASEL really 
shares and exudes and I'd like for us just to take note as we dive into our time together. The first is that SEL learning opportunities for families at home. Like what does that look like? How can we contribute to that? And how do we partner with families? The second is partners in reinforcing the student's social and emotional development. We'll hear some stories today that we know that if our kids are not well and they're not taken care of, they can't learn. So I could have the best teacher with the most degrees in front of kids. But if that student is not safe and taken care of, then learning simply just doesn't begin. Um, and ensuring that we have an inclusive decision-making process, how do we partner with our families and what does that look like to ensure that their voice is being heard? I'm not a big fan of, you know, I'm the voice of the people if you don't even know the people. Like the people need to be the voice of the people, not one individual. And two-way communication. I know that everyone loves CTLS and we're all very, very excited to have it, but we just wanna be very mindful that we're not throwing up on people and just sending out all of this information on a continuous basis and never stopping to pause, to check in and say, hey, what's going on? How are you? What can I do um, for you? So, um, the three things that I always just say and people that have been around me for a long time know, I always go to my three, you know, just my big rocks, I guess. It's just communicate, follow up, and ask questions. And I really believe that if we do those things consistently with our families and our students, everything else will just really work itself out. So again, I am one of six supervisors for our schools with Title I programs, um, but we support family engagement here at the district level with all of our schools. So I'm gonna look at the chat for just a few moments. Um, I would like for you to tell me what your positions are as I begin to dive into this work and to share some stories with you. Just kind of wanna see who do we have um, on the line Teresa Snow, I'm the um, South Cavalry Learning Center coordinator. Hello. Who Hello, else I'm do Sherry. We have? I'm Sherry Sutton. Um, I'm an ELA and Title One. I mean, I'm sorry, an ELA, ELA and ESOL uh, teacher at Pebble Brook. Cool. Nice to meet you. I see Tita's on the line. She's the AP at Lindley Six. And is that LaShonda? Oh yeah, I love my high school kids. <laughs> 16 year olds need to I be love. kissed too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hello, I'm LaSandra Dudley. I'm a special ed teacher and also I'm going to be the department chair uh, for MID this coming school year at Pebblebrook High School. Oh, nice. <laughs> well done. All right, I'm gonna hold you to that. You call me and be like, all right, let's get it. I'm Christina okay. Curtis. I was um, Read 180 and System 44 teacher pullout for third, fourth, and fifth grade at Teasley, unlimited contract. So I'm waiting to see if I'm picked up again. <laughs> oh, yeah. I have been limited contract four times. It is no fun. I, <laughs> I always make a joke and I'm like, I either doing something really, really good or something really, really wrong <laughs> because I've been rifted it um, four times. Um, you guys, if you remember, like maybe 10 or 14 years ago when they were going through all that, I got another job. I was paid out of this pot of money. So they're like, let you go, let you go, let you go, let you go. It's It's a stressful time, but... I'm sure it'll be fine. <laughs> um, Hi, I'm, I'm Missy Shackelford. I'm the principal at Blackwell Elementary School. Nice to meet you. And I don't wanna miss anybody. I thought I saw Melissa. Yeah, sorry. I have a toddler and a dog barking in the background. <laughs> <laughs> muting. Um, so my name is Melissa Barnhart. I am a teacher at Fry Elementary. Um, I'm gonna be kind of, well, never mind. I'm just gonna mute now. <laughs> That's okay. I got four of them. It's not That's a big deal. I was trying to meet earlier. <laughs> nice to meet you, Melissa. 
Awesome. Very cool. Well, I got, we have a good, you know, mixture of classroom teachers and administrators, which is fantastic. So just a little bit about the Title I program. We actually provide additional funds for schools that are economically disadvantaged um, and our most academically at risk kiddos. And we do have a pot of funds that we use um, to carry out the family and engagement opportunities, but I'm not going to really share anything that you really have to have money for other than just kind of an open mind. So let's jump into it. So I did start off by saying I was going to share some stories with you guys. And I think that, um, you know, just sharing what we've all kind of been through really helps us to set the stage on what we want to do next. So I want to talk to you a little bit about one of my students, Jocelyn and her brothers. I started off, I let you guys know that I speak Spanish. So this was really interesting. Um, Jocelyn was age appropriate for um, fifth grade and her brother was age appropriate for sixth grade, but no one could really communicate with them. Uh, we were having some difficulty. So like they both ended up in like fifth grade for a second and then we got them, you know, like fourth and fifth and we got them put in the right grades. Um, their background was they came from Guatemala I couldn't communicate with them, which was freaking me out because I felt like, hey, you know, my Spanish is pretty okay. My grandmother would not be this excited with me, but I should be okay. You know, I'm good. And um, come to find out, they actually were from a really small rural town in Guatemala and they spoke Quetzal. I didn't know that. So we just had a so much going on, you know, brand new kids, North American schooling. They actually had never really met their mother, even though they were like age appropriate fifth and sixth graders. The story was mom was young. She had the kids. She moved over to the United States. The grandmother kept the children until she was like in her 80s to 90s and just really couldn't do it anymore. So she literally like bought the kids a plane ticket and sent them to Marietta, Georgia. <laughs> you know, um, when they got here, they had two younger siblings that had never really met. The two older kids spoke Katzel. The parents spoke Spanish. They had a hard time communicating just to say the year was a lot of fun. Right. <laughs> um, so why I want to share her story is even though she was a newcomer, I had her as in my intensive English language class. Um, she was reading age appropriately pretty much in her own language. And I just couldn't figure out like what was going on with homework and turning in work. It was just literally just driving me nuts. And we talked so much. And again, you know, my thing is communicate, follow up, ask questions. So I feel like if I ask enough questions, I'll get to whatever's going on and we can solve it. Um, come to find out, um, she didn't have electricity. So that was huge. So when she kept coming to class every day, I don't have my homework. I didn't do it. You know, the first initial human response is I'm just extremely irritated, you know, like we've got things to do. You can't be walking in my classroom without your homework. Like that's not how it works here. You know, you got to do your homework. So digging a little bit deeper, realized she didn't have any electricity. So I just was like, oh, wow, this is a moment for me to just take a pause um, and figure out what we could do. So as a grade level team, I brought it to my team and I said, hey, I have a student that doesn't have electricity. We learned there was a couple of more students that didn't have electricity. Um, so we had to come up with a solution. We didn't wanna put the students on blast and make them feel uncomfortable about something that wasn't in their control and honestly wasn't in our control either. So what we did was we made pizza boxes and this is before laptops were like really cool. And we made laptop boxes. So like Pizza Hut donated laptop boxes and we um, put pencils, pens, we sent every week, we would send snacks home. So we sent five juice boxes and like five crackers so they could have a snack every day to go into their pizza box with their pencils, their notebook. And we had these cute little folders for like their homework assignments. And when I talked to Jocelyn about it, really that was a strategy that we did for the whole grade level, but we really did it for her and a couple of other students because we were like, take your box, outside, go on the front porch where there is light, do your homework. We had to give the kids a strategy to get the things done that they needed to do because inside of the home, it was pitch black. She lived in um, a trailer um, that's right around the corner from our office where we are now. And she lived there with three or four other families. So can you imagine like a one and a half bedroom trailer with a half bath with like 12 to 14 people living in it? You know, she just, it was her situation, but I knew all of that wasn't in my control, 
but I needed this student to achieve academically. So then I pulled mom aside and I was like, hey, you know, Jocelyn was letting me know that, you know, she's having some challenges getting her homework done. This is what I'm going to provide the snack, the juice, the paper pencils, encourage her to go outside, get her homework done where it's light, and then, you know, get her homework done because it's important for her to practice. Then we talked to mom about not having electricity and we had to make a plan for her to get that. We um, hooked her up with some people that helped pay the bill for a couple of months to get it down. And then tried to, we actually got her on like a schedule plan so that she was only paying, and I forget what it was, but it was like $35 a month versus like 150 some months at $50 just all over to help her financially, you know, provide for her kids. So what that looks like now. So thinking about the Jocelyn's in your life, the Jocelyn's in your classroom and in your school building, if I wouldn't have taken the time just to have that communication, to follow up with the parents, make the extra phone call to the electric company, continue to ask questions, then she may have not been a successful student because on the outside, she just looked like a student who just didn't do her homework. We all have had that kid, but digging just a little bit deeper, I was able to learn that there were some things preventing her from doing her homework that we could help. Um, so what that looks like now on a greater scale here in Cobb is we have something called um, Family Partnership and Mentor Network. And what we do in this particular instance is the school identifies um, the types of families or the students that they would like to provide a mentor for. And a mentor is provided, which helps with the adult efficacy, where the students are making their SMART goals for their learning. The parents are given those SMART goals for learning so that the parents can make a plan to help their student achieve at home. But the parent can also make their own SMART goal. And we monitor families for three, six months, nine months, or 12 months, depending on the, what their goal is and the length of time it will take them to achieve their goal. And we've had parents get lights turned on forever and ever. We've had parents not work a second job anymore because they didn't want to do that. I just um, worked with a family um, over the summer who um, she has two years of nursing, but now she has four kids. She's not able to really go back to school. But with all the COVID money, with some a few phone calls, we figured out a way for her to keep her um, money coming in so that she's not unemployed, but go to school full time. And instead of her making her $35,000 that she's going to be making now, she's going to make 60 or 70 as an RN in two years. But that adult efficacy, that adult change, it's what's going to ultimately affect her children and her children are going to have a better quality of life. And the evidence is there that the students will do better academically. So I'm going to share a few more stories with you, but I want you to just kind of sit and think for just a few moments, like who is the Jocelyn in your life? Like who was that person over the last few years that, you know, you probably could have probed a little bit more or you did probe and you were able to help because you just found out just one more thing about that student. Uh, the next story I want to share with you is a middle school story. story. And this is Marisol. She is from Honduras. Um, and she was a student of mine, middle school. And um, she had very low attendance, like just kind of came to school whenever she wanted, <laughs> in my opinion. Um, and at that particular time, we had a lot of girl fights. I don't know what was in the water that year. It was just like, every day it was some girl fight somewhere. So as a teacher, I'm like, that's the counselor's thing. I'm not getting involved with that. That's not for me, but it was affecting my classroom. It, you know, the drama never stopped. And I thought, okay, Natalie, just ask the kids what's going on. So Marisol being the ringleader, I just went to her and was like, hey, you know, you're in the hallways literally every morning. You're either not here or you're in a fight or someone else is in a fight and you're commentating the fight, like, what can we do? And I said, so I invited her to my classroom and I said, just do me a favor. I don't know what's going on, but I'd like to hear from you about what's going on because maybe there's something we can do together. I don't know. So when you get off the bus in the morning, I want you to just get your breakfast. I'm gonna get my breakfast. This is what time I'm here. And we're gonna have breakfast in my classroom. 
every morning, just like mm-hmm. until you just are tired of not looking at me anymore. And she was like, mm-hmm. fine, Miss Hutchins, whatever, you know, fine. Wow. Well, she started coming to my class for a week, two weeks. Then eventually I had like 30 girls, five girls, 12 girls, 20 girls in my classroom that used to all be in the hallway fighting. And when it was when a safe space was made so that they could stay out of conflict and stay out of trouble, they had a safe space. They started communicating with each other, talking about things they didn't like, what they did. I had some norms. I was like, listen, as long as you're not fighting or cussing each other out, what happens in this classroom stays in this classroom kind of thing. And they were very, very successful. Um, That year, our discipline decreased greatly overall in the school just because a couple of kids were getting what they needed emotionally. Her attendance was better. She wasn't coming to school because the kids, it was a lot of bullying going on, um, talking about her clothes or hair, just different things like that. But once all of the students started to communicate a little bit better, and even though they weren't best friends, they were still forming some bonds, a lot of the bullying decreased as well. So At first, I could have just looked at this student and been like, all she wants to do is get in trouble, cuss and fight, you know, but I decided to just slow down, communicate, follow up, ask a bunch of questions. Um, So what that looks like now is um, that breakfast club eventually turned into a school-wide breakfast club. Um, And in our district, we are launching this year our first cohort of the Harvard Family Dinner Project. And basically, um, the Harvard students have done a lot of uh, research and their family dinner project is pretty epic. It's really cool. Um, And what it does is it teaches parents how to have conversations with their students over a meal. And I don't know if any of you guys are like me, but I still have dinner with my kids all the time. Um, We play a game, two truths and a lie. Um, My coworker was just laughing at me because I was literally on the phone with um, one of the kiddos and I was like, hey, you know, the ribs are in the oven at 425. I need you to turn it to 225. Like, don't burn my dinner. You know, (laughs) dinner is a big, big deal at our house. And it's a really good time for us just to just say hello, like put the phones down, just calm the noise and check in with each other. And when my kids got to middle school, honestly, I didn't even really like the children at that point. I was like, I'm not really sure if I'm a, a made to be a middle school parent. Tita, I know you got a middle schooler. I'm like, why did God invent middle school? Like he could have skipped this whole two, three year situation. And, um, I had to figure out something to do with my kids. So we started playing two truths and a lie at dinner a couple times a week just to get the kids talking. And they were trying to up each other on the two truths and a lie. But I'm just going to tell you, I learned a lot about kids (laughs) over dinner and what happens in schools and when my kids don't feel safe and when their peers don't feel safe and when they do what that looks like. And so we're inviting Harvard in to help our families so that our families can have a network of other families that they can talk to about the things that are going on and that we give them pro healthy meals um, and healthy guidance on how to have open-ended conversation with their students because we know that with the right questioning and just that time spent talking about academics and what the expectations are the students ultimately do better so that's my Marisol story um, and that is the next cohort that we have coming up in um, in July The next story I wanted to share with you is a story from one of our high schools with um, Title I programs. And I will just be honest with you. I don't know how else to say it. I know this call is being recorded, but the econ scores, let's just say we're in the tank. (laughs) You know, and we're just trying to figure out like, what the heck is going on with econ? So we're writing down all of our challenges and we're like, okay, well, econ is only a semester, the high schools are on block, the t- take econ the beginning, you don't take the exam to the end, like there are all of these nuances. Then I said, okay, we sat with the teachers, we sat with the, the coaches, and then I said, well, let's bring some parents in because the parents probably have some insight. So we bought some parents in that had already had their kids go through econ and was like, hey, how was your experience? What is it about? And everyone had a different 
picture of what econ looked like. The teachers were like, the kids just can't remember the information to take the test. We're like, we're staying on block. And then the parents were like, well, one of the big issues is that the school does four projects a year. The projects are 20% of the grade and the projects had horrible, horrible grades. No one was turning them in. So we had a bunch of like spaghetti kind of ideas going on. Well, what we ended up coming up with was, all right, let's just try this. And I really felt this pain um, as a parent myself. I tell people all the time, I'm a Title I parent. I live in a Title I neighborhood and my kids go to Title I school. So I live my job. I know what that looks like. And um, honestly, I hated it too. My kids were in middle school and I mean, one year, both of the kids, they had projects at the same time. And I was spending more than $60. And one parent said it, you know, sitting, spending $60 every six weeks or nine weeks to go to Home Depot to buy light bulbs and switches. And honestly, the teacher looks at it and then she puts that stuff in the trash. If you are serving students and financial responsibilities are already a burden, it's not fair for us as a district to put an additional undue burden on parents. It's just not fair. So the students are acting all big and bad, like I just don't want to do the project, but then the parents aren't purchasing the materials for the project. So you see how like everything was just kind of on top of each other. So what we ended up doing was we sent out a schedule that said here to the parents, here are when the projects are due. Here is the list of materials for the projects. But we went a step further and we actually purchased every single thing that the parents would need for the projects. We had a translator come um, and we had one of our expert history teachers or social studies teachers teach what we needed to do during our family engagement nights. Now this is econ, so you're talking 10, 11, 12th graders. We had, I think 126 kids maybe enrolled in econ. Everybody's parent came, honestly, everybody's parent came and people were really shocked. And I'm like, well, I'm not shocked because we identified a clear problem and we're helping people to solve it. People will come when it's important to them. They're not going to come to school to read a book with their kids. They can do really that. Quick question. Did, yes. did you offer it um, like at different times during the day? Was it offered on Saturdays or did was it just one time in the evening? How did, how did you schedule that? It was just one time in the evening. You're at Pebble Brook, right? Yes. So um, it was Um, So we offered it one time in the evening, but we have a parent facilitator at the school. So if anybody wasn't able to make it, she would meet with them one on one as needed. So we just ensured that everybody had an opportunity to get. And thank you for just bunching in because I can't see that. And that's fine. Yeah, no. And here's another question with that. So I know. um, and this, uh, this is a wonderful idea. I hadn't even thought about that. Of course, um, we're all struggling with different ELC test scores and stuff. Mm-hmm. Do you, if you need supplies for your students like that, do you have to do it like a year in advance where you say these are the things we need? Or does the Title I department generally have a little bit of reserve for supplies? Well, we don't keep any reserves at all. We give 100% of our budget to the schools. So you would just really need to talk to Dr. Giles about those needs and what you're seeing that kids need Um, to switch just another thought about that one of our other high schools um, you know the calculators are like 100 bucks right those ti whatever this is that they have like 120 dollars well we trained the teachers on how to use the calculators and we also did a parenting class for the calculators and every parent that came to the class got a calculator for their student, but that was something that that school put into their budget oh, because I it was so that. important for the kids to have what they needed to do um, the homework. Yep. And um, when we started off with the econ, people were really just floored by the number of people that really just came. And I was like, I'm not surprised because you're giving people what they want. And I would just put it in the chat because I just want to see what, what you thought. When we started, remind you, Econ, 20% of the econ grade was these four big projects that they had to do, right? So they only had about 33% of their kids turning these projects in prior to our intervention. What do you think the percentage was at the end of the year? 
like after all four. How much did you say, Sherry? 80%. Okay, Sherry's got 80. Let's see. Melissa says 80. Anybody else? Got some guesses, Christina? What 90. are you thinking? I'll go high. <laughs> You'll go high? It's 90. <laughs> well, I will tell you that it was less than 1%. Out of all of the projects, we only had five, not people, but just five projects over the four that weren't turned in over the year. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. And it was, again, communicating, following up, and asking questions. I mean, from the teacher standpoint, these kids don't ever want to do anything. From the kids, they want to be hard. They don't want to tell you they don't have money. So the kids like, I ain't doing that. The parents are like, look, we can't afford these projects. Please stop. So what appeared on the surface to be, you know, just an issue by just bringing people in together. And that's what I love about Castle saying, you know, how do you bring stakeholders alongside of you when you're making these decisions? If I, the lady at central office, would have just come down with my fairy wand and like, here's $200, figure it out the kids would have not improved. Um, and it's something that the, um, I don't know if the econ teachers did it this year because it was a crazy year, but I will be checking in with them. Um, so, and what that looks like now in our districts is we um, have a cohort with, this will be our third year for academic parent teacher teams. And what the academic parent teacher teams does is it looks at the grade level standards or the core standards, depending on, you know, if you're middle or high, and we meet with those families four times a year and they are getting specific strategies on what their student is missing. So if it's say a writing standard, they are shown a portfolio of where their kid ranks in the class. We always have a ghost kid at the top because you don't want your kid to be the smartest kid in the classroom. And we always have a ghost score at the very bottom. I know this isn't a politically correct word, but we don't want your kid to be the dumb kid in the classroom either. Like nobody wants their kid to be last. <laughs> so we have those two ghost scores and the kids fluctuate, you know, in between. They're given a number, but they can say, hey, I know that Marco, Nico, all my kids' names, Miles, Peyton, whoever, you know, they need help on this particular you know, thing, when I come, I'm actually gonna get that. No, I'm not gonna come to your school to read with your kids because I can do that if I feel like it. But if you're telling me, you know, Mark is having an issue on this then and I'm gonna come and get support on that, yeah, I'll make that a priority, I'll come. And so that's what that looks like now um, in our academic parent teacher teams. And the last story I wanna share with you guys is um, just the students being in the driver's seat. I told you before that I love partnering with schools and adopting a classroom. Well, this particular year, I adopted student council. It was um, in an area where they were trying to do a student council with middle and high school. And I was like, ooh, how cool would that be? So um, I participated with their student council. And during a part of the student council is for them to look at a variety of you know, data on academics. And the high school student council, they were looking at the science standards. And this was important because this was the year that we we're getting all the curriculum. And so you guys may remember, like, we didn't have textbooks and, you know, it was just kind of weird. Like science was really having a hard time. The state was rolling out new standards and it was just kind of wonky. Um, and so we pulled out some standards for the high school kids and solubility was a huge standard that it starts in, I think, seventh grade and kids just never get it. And it's in our district, I'm not sure why. So we were asking the kids, you know, how are we gonna solve this? What do we need to do? One of the kiddos, his dad was a roofer and he was like, well, my dad could teach this class because my dad does this and da 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 da. I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. So I reached out to the dad and said, hey, you know, we're having issues with our kids learning this solubility. It's not going away. What could you do? And he was like, well, let's think about this and let's think about that. And um, we're our big project-based learning district. And this school was a PBL, both of the schools were PBL schools. So what we did with that school is um, we had, we invited everybody to Home Depot. We actually shut Home Depot down. The fire marshal came and told us we had too many people. So if you can imagine 500 people in a Home Depot doing science projects, yeah. Go big or go home in Cobb, that's what I say. <laughs> um, 
he came and he literally taught our kids. He gave them a budget and said, hey, you got $150. You've got a leak in your roof. Here's some different materials. We've got to test them out. You've got to tarp and fix your roof for 150 bucks or less. The other option is that you leave the hole in your roof because for a roofer to come and do it, to fix it, even though it was a small hole, um, it'll be 500 bucks. So what do you do? We did a pre-test with the students. We taught the solubility hands-on lesson with the parents. The parents were the teachers. They went to this whole project-based learning experience, took them about an hour, um, hour and a half. The kids didn't even want to leave. And then they went back to the school and took a post-test. Everybody scored well. Everybody was within the 84% or higher. And it was just amazing to see that the kids knew this is such an abstract concept. Flashcards aren't going to work. The students knew that, the student council knew that, but we weren't really teaching it that way. We're kind of our drill and kill with the vocabulary cards. So now we have math and science learning launch events where teachers can actually go through a self-paced course on CTLS. I will show you where that is. And we have a library full of um, lessons for our pre-K through 12th grade. So there are lots of great bands that are represented um, and learn about hosting your own learning launch and how that brings project-based learning, the four C's into the fold so that kids can have that hands-on real world experience. And especially in middle and high school, trying to connect student learning to future careers like your moms and dads and your aunts and uncles, they do this stuff all the time. But one of those engagement strategies is keeping kids engaged, is share, sharing with them how noting the coplanar field is going to help you do whatever else it is that you want to do or daily tasks that maybe your parents do all the time that you don't think of. And we had a similar middle school um, discovery with rate of change. I believe that's a seventh grade standard. And we ended up recording a whole series of videos for families so that they had the introduction to the concepts, but we weren't talking to the kiddos. We we're talking to the parents about, hey, here's some questions you can ask your kids. Here are some things to look for. Here are stories that you can talk to your kids about when you're driving in the car about rate of change so that they can have this in their mind. Like, what is it about? And we gave them different scenarios in that video so that they could just be in the car, be in Walmart, wherever they are, and they could just talk to their kids about the real world pieces to that um, and help helping the kids do better academically. Um, so this is actually a picture of Jocelyn. Um, I found her on my Twitter. That's a shame I've had Twitter since like 2005 or something. <laughs> didn't even realize it was that old. Um, so I want you to just kind of think about your why and people say that all the time, but I really did share with you a few of my whys, like the kids are why I do this. I, I just, I love it so much. I could not imagine, you know, doing anything else. And this is a moment when we can unmute our mics and just have a conversation because I wanna ask us a few questions and kind of hear from you what's good, what's bad, what's ugly um, going on in the world out there and um, see how we can help. So we talked about the importance of building relationships and how maybe something that seems like an irritant, if we dig a little bit deeper, we could you know, unearth what's really going on. And I wanted to ask you guys in just an, an everyday conversation, what does it look like when families are involved in their children's education? Like, what does that look like to you guys? Well, um, hi, I'm Missy. I'm from Blackwell Elementary School. I'll jump in if it's okay. Yeah. We're not a title school, but mm -hmm. we're always on the cusp. I mean, we have around 45% free and reduced lunch. Um, and so, you know, we're probably never going to go title, but we're also never going to be in that, um, you know, thing where we can depend on parents to provide for for our kids, the way that some schools have parents. So we're just in this sweet spot of, you know, not necessarily title, but also not necessarily, um, you know, ha have a lot of family support. But my question is, and my struggle is, when we have things here at school, like a school carnival, we have families come out in droves. I mean, it's just packed. It's, it's, 
you know, it, it's, it's crazy. When we have an academic night, no, we, we don't get that support. And we try to do RISE where we had parents involved with math fluency and reading fluency. And, you know, we had a, a, the first time where they kind of saw where their kid was. We gave them packets of things to do at home, like um, math games. We included the dice and the directions that they, it would, they could do at home and, and reading where we gave them the actual books and the um, conversation starters to have at home. And we were, and we had such a low turnout and it was done at night. Um, and we tried to, you know, kind of get them to come. And my frustration is, is sometimes when you're trying to do the academic things to get the parents involved in their kids' education, even at an elementary school level, it's very, very hard. But if you're having the, the big throwdown, you know, food trucks and carnival mm -hmm. or whatever, here they all come. I'm, I, it is so frustrating as a principal. And my, my question to you is, how do we get that same family engagement on the academic side as we do on the fun side? That's a great question. That's an age old question. And um, I'm going to be frank and honest, because that's the only way I know to be a lot. I do believe that there's a lot, there's a lot that you just unpacked, you know, in that particular so that's not a silver bullet. But a couple of things are, first of all, I got four kids, I'm just going to be honest with you. So anytime with my own personal kids, remember, I'm a title one mama, whose kids went to title one school. And I would tell the principals, like, listen, I'm not coming to read books with my kid. I can literally read books. I don't need to go to school to do that. But if you called me and said Marco was having trouble in X and I needed to be somewhere so that it was specific for him, because I honestly don't care about the rest of the kids at your school. I do care about Miles, Peyton, Mark, and Evelyn. Those are the kids that I care about. So if you tell me that it's something specifically for him, that I'm more inclined to come. So thinking about the academic nights and what you're providing, what do the parents need and what do they want? Not what do we think that they need and want because educators, we're great at thinking. We don't, our parents don't know what they want, you know? So what is it that they really need and want? And you might need to pull some of those parents together where the kids are not being academically successful and ask them because you're overachiever parents. They're going to come to everything anyway. And think about it. Like, okay, if I've got five kiddos, right. Just being honest with you, they're old, older now, but like I have at any one time I've had an high schooler, two middle schoolers and an elementary, like that was the most, you know, kind of spread out. We've got football, we've got baseball, we've got cheer and whatever else those kids do. So I have to decide on my calendar of things, when am I going to do the extra stuff? The we want to make sure we do. Yeah, we, we want to make sure we do the fun stuff with our kids because that's literally the only time I see the kids is when we're doing fun stuff. Otherwise, I'm yelling at them about homework. So that's always going to be the priority. So how do you move the academics up? to be a more, you know, higher on the priority list, it's got to be specific for those kids. And it takes a little bit of work, but it's not impossible to do. So think about your whole school and then think about those kids that you would identify being the most academically at risk. Who are the kids who haven't made the gains for a year or two years? Who are the kids? And you've got to ask your teachers, like, who are the kids that are just silent and compliant that maybe we haven't tapped on? Whose parents have we, not this year, I think about last year, <laughs> whose parents have we never seen? They're fifth grade now, we've never seen them and the kids are struggling. How do we make a plan to reach out to those parents to say, hey, what do you need? And two interventions kind of come to mind that aren't like really cost, don't, they don't cost a lot. One of them is with the academic parent teacher teams, which sounds a lot like your rise, is if you say you had rise with third grade and I know Blackwell's got what, 800 kids. How many kids you'll have? Like 730. Yes. Yeah. I'm pretty good with the numbers. Yeah. So, okay. You've got 730 kids. You're going to do this with third grade. You have 130 third graders, right? Yeah. We want to invite all 130 third graders, but out of your five or six teachers that you have teaching that grade level, if they gave you a high five and said, here are the five that we want to make sure come, 
Is it more important for us to have the numbers or is it more important for us for the 25 kids in third grade who are suffering to make sure their parents get what they need so that those students' academics will, will pull up? And think about that and the quantitative value of how that trickle effect is because those parents have other kids. And if they get into the habit of hey, I'm going to learn how to do this game with my kid, but then they also need to have that commitment part. If you give me the resources in the bag, when am I turning it back into you? Where is the list that I had to sign off that I had to do it? And when am I going to get enough, uh, more stuff? So if they're having, you know, say, hey, the caveat is when you come, we're going to give you this game to play. We want you to do this for two weeks, two times or three times a day. Here's a sign off sheet for him. When he finishes, what we're going to do is we're going to let him retake an assessment. And that's what we do with like the APTT, the academic parent teacher teams. They have a pretest, they have a learning intervention, and those students are able to take the retest because what the parent is saying is I'm going to make sure that I work on this skill because you told me my son needed it. Not everybody in that classroom, but my kid needed it. And so I'm going to work on those and he's going to be able to take that retest. And when the parents start seeing that kind of a partnership, that ebb and flow, they're just more inclined to come, but they're not coming for the general stuff. You, I mean, you're, you're at the bottom of the priority bowl. Yeah. Even for and me. I wish it, I wish, I wish it wasn't that way. Um, you know, I wish that because, you know, I know our teachers put a lot of time and energy mm -hmm. nights. And so I wish it wasn't that way, but I think you've hit on something, um, something that I'll think about and that we'll do is you, know, it doesn't, the nights that we have the STEM nights and the math nights, that's great for the whole school, but for this true academic not just the the gameplay, but the true academic, it really needs to be focused on the kids we want there. And it doesn't mm -hmm. for the whole school. And I think um, we we try to say, you know, I, I would rather skip a night for the entire school if I could get the 25% that I need. You know what I mean? Like I'm not mm -hmm. their plates. We can take something off their plates, but I certainly would love to have a day where we get those 20 and just a phone call from a, the, um, the teacher that says, hey, this is specifically for you and your kid. You know, that I think would go a long way than just a flyer in a notebook. And it really does. The schools that we have that really just have a group of parents, like who are the people that we want? The who are the kids that we need to move? Like, who are they? You've got to identify yeah, that them makes a lot of and sense. go out of there out of their way. Cause I will tell you my daughter, I felt so bad. I'm a horrible teacher parent. Just letting y'all know, just totally honest. She didn't read till she was like in second grade. It was crazy. And she was like, my brothers will read for me. I don't need to. I was like, girl, you actually have to read on your own. She's like, why? My kid didn't, did not read forever. I just didn't read forever. Yeah, and I'm she was in read, way. I had to put her in read 180. And I specifically had to go to, you know, her teacher was like, hey, and everybody knows me because I told you I had four kids, right? So they've all been at the same school. So by the time they got to the last one, they're like, this isn't our normal phone call to you, but we're going to need an intervention. <laughs> and when they started telling me I had to come and do things specifically for Evelyn, it, it moved immediately up. To the well, priority yeah, I, if it were my kid too, I would, if they said, look, Sammy needs some specific help. We need you to come to this night. I would be there. So yeah. Okay. Great advice. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. And another well, idea. I'm, I'm, I don't know if this helps Ms. Shackelford. Um, my previous school used it as well. We switched it from nights because it was so difficult for everybody and their families to get there. We rotated them through um, lunch sessions. So it's the oh, idea nice. we do, you do. And we just kind of shifted and everybody kind of just, for lack of a better word, sucked it up, but we were all <laughs> there and they could find babysitters maybe easier during the day. Um, and then we rotated them through lunch. So the, the parents got that segment and then they had, they worked with their child. So their child could show them exactly where everything was and what they did. And then they could choose to eat lunch with siblings or whatever. So they made contact with other grade levels at the time or whatever. But when we switched it from evenings to the day, we saw a little bit increase in um, attendance just for a, a different idea. But that was my previous district, so. And we um, have had some tremendous, I'm tremendous about. success with Zoom and Teams because parents are like, look, I don't have to get in my car and take three other kids with me to do something for 45 minutes. Um, we've had tremendous success um, with like APTT, 
packaging up everything, sending it the night before on the bus with the student and being like, do not open this bag, it goes to your mama and them having everything that they need at home to play the game. So sorry to well, I'm, interrupt I'm you. Loving, I'm loving this idea. We have a, we have quite a few students that are dually served with our population. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of ESOL special education students. And um, some of them are, you know, they struggle uh, in many different ways. So I'm loving what you're saying about targeting them and saying, you know, and, and not targeting in a negative way, but, yeah. but really identifying. Yeah, identifying them, <laughs> identifying them. <laughs> and um, thinking of ways that we can embrace their parents. Of course, we, we have our, um, our our Title I parent person as well for, for, for the, the Spanish speaking. And then, you know, for our students that have other languages, that still begins to be a challenge in getting their parents in. But I'm loving this where we could just have a specific night for those parents or even a Saturday. Um, we have super Saturdays at our school where kids recover credits and try mm -hmm. to do, but maybe we could have it like a super parent time too. So we got one side where the students are coming in, another side where the parents are coming in just to work on skills to be able to help their kids. So I love this idea. Yeah, it's um, it just takes a little thinking, just, um, you know, a little creativity. I'm going to drop something in the chat for you guys. Um, this is a link to RSVP for support um, and training on any of these interventions. We do have a wait list right now um, for that, but that's always a good thing because if I have more people, then we can open up more training. You know what I mean? So if you are interested in anything, I know we have some administrators on, and I know that not everyone has Title I funds, but we are still one district, one goal. You know what I mean? We'll figure it out. We'll get you what you need. And tell me again, um, what is what is that that you sent the, the link? link? I just dropped in the chat. We are providing training in July for each one of these interventions. So if you'd like to RSVP for training, yeah. you know, then feel free to fill out the um, survey monkey. Um, if you're in a title school, check with your administrator because um, they may have something already going on or they may have already RSVP'd. But if you're in a school without a title program, I would also encourage you to use the link to RSVP because again, if we have people that are interested, we'll figure a way to, to get people what they need or just some additional support, you know. Um, so um, even though this next slide talks about the challenges and contributing factors, I appreciate you saying this, Sherry, but what resources do we have out there for like our non-English speaking um, speakers and our students with disabilities and our various grade levels? I will tell you with all of the interventions that we have and things that we try to kick off, we ensure that there is um, an ESOL teacher involved. So they're looking at all the materials, they're looking at what we're giving out and we're passing out. There's also an SSA who partners with us to ensure that they read through our lesson plans, especially with those hands-on lesson plans with like our learning launch challenges, because things I didn't really think about um, we have weighted, we've had to order weighted jackets for kids that, you know, are going to be there. They've had to get slate boards and certain pencils. Um, we've had, um, if their dexterity is low, you know, we couldn't use Play-Doh, we used some magic moon sand or whatever. Maybe we had to have pieces cut out previously ahead of time. So consider that when you're thinking about supporting your kiddos, they might be in your classroom without an accommodation, but be in another classroom with an accommodation, or perhaps their parents and don't have, you know, 100% command of the language, and we might need a partner with someone to ensure that they have someone that they can call and ask questions to. And I'm really excited about the CTLS translating and all that good stuff. I've heard really good things about it this year. Um, and just to kind of think about our contributing um, factors, I'm going to switch my screen share for just a second to show you guys something. And I know that there's someone right after me. I was never a good closer. Um, for teachers. So um, that has not improved. If I had an evaluation, it would still say the same thing. <laughs> so I'm going to show you. Um, not this desktop, desktop number two. And I'd like to show you if you um, were interested in the science or math challenges 
and you go to CTL less and you click on professional learning. It's so much stuff on this page. I would just type in the word launch. And I don't know if, the, you're, if you're, are you sharing your oh, screen with this? Yeah, you can't see it? No. Oh, sorry. It's because I have three monitors. My bad. You can see it now. Awesome. I just clicked on. My apologies. Um, I went to professional learning on CTLS and then I just typed in the word launch and it will bring up the Title I Learning Launch. And this course is um, a course that's been up for a couple of years. Anyone can participate in the course. There are four modules. <clears throat> it talks about looking at your standards, identifying the students that you want to identify, pre and post testing, um, creating a lesson plan, how to look at the data to ensure that st students move, as well as actually hosting the event, ordering supplies and all that good stuff. So if you are interested, this is something you could do independently on your own. The other three that I mentioned were in the process of building those professional learnings. Sorry, let me just ask you this right quick. Sure. When you look at the learning, and forgive me for cutting in, learning mm -hmm. launch, in, in, are you saying that this is something that's already there that you can just request and you can get supplies for? Or are you saying this is something you have to put in your Title I budget to be able to? You, you would definitely have to put it in your Title I budget if you wanted gotcha. to purchase the supplies, but the professional learning is there. And a lot of times there's not, you don't always have to have lots and lots of supplies. Um, so I, we've had some teachers just do this independently in their classroom with project-based learning that they wanted to do, but they're bringing their parents alongside of the project-based learning versus just, you know, do them in, in the classroom. And it's a really great way to engage families and making the connection between we're learning to do this so that when we're, when we're adults, we can cut coupons. <laughs> we're learning to do this so that when we're adults, we can fix our own homes. <laughs> or, you know, what does that look like if I want to be an advertising agent? Um, these are why we teach all these wonderful standards. So it just walks you through how to identify challenging or low related Cobb teaching and learning standards and how to build a lesson plan um, that includes families. And we do have lesson plans already. So in there. But I did want to show you where that is. And then we're going to be adding those other courses in July that we mentioned earlier. So, um, well, that was really it for me. I appreciate you guys being here. I just wanted to, you know, share um, some of the experiences that I've had and with a variety of different teachers and um, Hopefully you walk away with a little something. And if you need me, you know how to reach me. I'm here from seven to five, at least all summer, right? <laughs> here every day. So if you have more questions or if you wanna say something for the good of the group, I would love for you to. Thank you so much. Thank You're you. You're welcome. Very informative. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to drop the evaluation in the chat and that is all for me. Um, Ms. Hutchins, if you can, I, I just want you to go back to that website that you just showed. I mean, you know, that place mm -hmm. on CTLS and actually click on one of those, like that first one that you had sure. so I can see what it is that I would be looking at. Oh, absolutely. I am going to let me get this link really quick and throw it in the chat. Um, And I'm going to share my screen. This time I'll click share. <laughs> so in each one of these modules, we have some directions and you have your module resources and my contact information. You will go down to the assignment tab and you'll, you know, take the assignment and then the assessment tab is where you act. Oh, we don't have assessments on this one. Sorry, I have, I have just so many courses. So let's go into the assignment. And with each one of these, if you want, let me, I'm going to stop sharing. For, do you have 15 more minutes or are you ready to go? I don't know one about anybody else, but I have 15 minutes. Okay, cool. I'm going to stop sharing one second because what I'm going to do is I'm going to add this sound and let me let you watch like one of the introductory um, videos so you can see um, 
what we're what we're talking about here. If you can't hear this, let me know. But each one of these modules is pretty much the same. It gives you the directions. You're gonna watch the video. Then you're gonna do the participant response tab. And there is like a homework assignment for each. Well, this one is the introductory. So let me go to a different one. That's the infomercial. Let me just go to a different one. That's the introductory. On this one for my assignments, um, you actually have your um, form that you're going to fill out. So each one of these, like this talks about the lesson planning, you actually will have the, when it comes up, and these are all PDF editable forms so that you could actually go through the course. So this is what your learning launch teaching and learning guide looks like. And so each one of those has, it goes over the forms, what you need to do and all gotcha. that good stuff. So I'll play a little bit of it. And when you're, they're not long, they're like four minutes, but if you're tired of listening to it, just be like, okay, turn it off. I'm good. <laughs> Welcome to the learning launch course module one. In this module, you will view an actual learning launch, review your school-wide data, and explore the components of the Teaching and Learning Guide. Take a moment to download the Learn and Launch Teaching and Learning Guide to your mobile device or print it for note taking while watching the tutorial. Before we begin the tour, I ask that you consider three to four teammates that you would like to partner with you as part of the Learn and Launch lesson planning team. This team will view your grade level or school-wide data. You may wish to invite them to participate in this tutorial as well in order to gain first-hand knowledge of the Learn and Launch design and expectations. You will now view an actual learning launch. This learning launch was planned and executed with Office Depot. Grab a writing tool and a sheet of paper. As you are viewing this learning launch, jot down five verbs that you would use to describe what you see in the video. Enjoy. Office Depot is committed to learning. So when the Cobb County School District wanted to engage families in their students' education, Office Depot listened. It's been really challenging getting both parents and students to come back into the schools for different math and science nights. We started thinking about the retail stores and how we could utilize the Office Depot, Office Max retail stores. So just shifting our mindset a little bit to saying, well, why don't we take learning where the families are instead of complaining that the families don't come see us. All leading to this family engagement event held in a local Office Depot store drawing hundreds of people to work on interactive lesson plans at various age-appropriate stations. This is a great location, which is really the center of where a lot of our schools are. So they're loving it because we're doing it on their terms in an environment where they're most comfortable. A learning environment Office Depot's education experts collaborated with Cobb County to create. Office Depot decided to provide some real world challenges for our students and show students that the things that you learn in school, people use it every day. So some sessions will deal with maker spaces where students will be creating their own types of products. They'll be looking at furniture to go into a collaborative space. We're providing them with the resources and then the teachers are coming in and backfilling to make sure that everything lines up with the curriculum while also providing an interactive environment that engages students and families. The parents get a chance to actually work beside the teachers. It's a very uh, strong component of education. I'm seeing people um, from parts of the county that I, that I usually don't get to see, um, parents that I usually don't get to talk to. We got to work and collaborate together, and that was really, really an exciting thing. And it's an excitement Cobb County and Office Depot will continue to share collaborating on more of these events aimed at engaging families and improving student achievement.
I actually just believe that you need to partner with people who are able to provide the tools to help you um, in the classroom. The great thing about Office Depot, they are thinking critically, they are taking on challenges, they are working collaboratively, and those are experiences that we are trying to simulate in the classroom, so it's simply a symbiotic relationship that really, really just works. are chosen. Choose two to three teaching and learning standards. Earlier in the tutorial, we asked that you download the Learning Launch Teaching and Learning Guide. I didn't realize I was on mute. Done so. so, you know what? I was going to say something, but I was like, maybe she's not talking to us. Okay, I think no. I'm good on this. Yeah, the so I was just saying, it just walks you through each one of the. To um, help you pre just it'll walk you through how to go through each one of those guides. So you're never left on your own. If you have questions, you could always reach out to me, but this is um, one of the things that, you know, it'll just, it just walks you through every single piece of it. Okay, so well, very good. I appreciate you. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, you too, Sherry. I have to come by and say um, hello. I would love <laughs> when we get back that. into buildings. <laughs> I would love for you to do that. Thank you again. Okay. You're welcome. Have a good afternoon. All right. You too. Bye. Bye.